Hey, can you all hear me without the microphone? Yeah. Yes, 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 sir. Hey, I got to thank you. Hey, Joe, thank you. I know some many folks in here I've had the opportunity to meet with and talk with. Uh, my name is David Jolly. I'm running for Congressman Young's uh, recently vacated seat, Florida Congressional District 13. I got to tell you, although I've never been in this room, which can be a little bit intimidating, uh, it was a little bit of a breath of fresh air to walk in to this room because my core convictions uh, are really those that I believe align very closely with this group. I joined the Republican Party when I was old enough to vote because I believed in a party that represented the equality of opportunity. I believed in a, a, a party that represented most individual freedom, individual liberty, that dispensed with the notion that, as we talk about today, of individual mandates. Uh, I worked on the Hill on a project for a little while and talked about the opportunity to fail and why that was a particular American concept, an, an American ideal, that we all have the opportunity no matter where we are born, no matter where we are raised, no matter where we come from, we have the opportunity to make of our life exactly what we need to make of it. It's a very special thing, the equality of opportunity. That means something to me because you're going to hear a lot in this race. I know what my opponents are going to say about me. I have no question. I would love to run a race against myself because it's too easy to run a race against myself. I'm going to get hit as somebody who's a Washington insider. I know that. I want to talk about that every day because I want to talk about what it means to get things done in Washington and the fact that I'm the most effective person to do it. But I also want to tell you why that's wrong. For those of you who joined my announcement on Thursday, I, I said this and I will say it again today. I don't come from means. My grandfather worked construction right up here in Clearwater for the old J.B. Hunt Construction Company. My father was a minister at Calvary Baptist Church. When I graduated from college, I had never been north of Tennessee. But what I had was the support of my family, the faith of my God, and the sacrifice of my parents that allowed me to pursue my interest and my dream in working in public policy. So I did that. What drew me to the Republican Party was the equality of opportunity theme. But it also was because it was a party that I recognized, understood, that fiscal issues, how our government taxes, how our government spends, those fiscal issues ultimately are freedom issues. And that is something that is a central tenet to this race for me personally. We all know the numbers, this group in particular, I know you know the numbers. When this president took office, our cumulative national debt over the past 220 years of our republic sat at about $10 trillion. In the course of 220 years, we accumulated $10 trillion in debt. When this president leaves office, that number will be $20 trillion. He will have doubled in eight years what took 220 years for our nation to accumulate. Why does that matter? Look at Thomas Jefferson's writing. Thomas Jefferson said, we have a moral obligation to pay our debts during the life of the majority. That means during our generation. It is immoral to leave to future generations the debt we accumulate. George Washington said the greatest threat our nation faces is not from offshore, it's fiscal issues and it's debt. That matters. The greatest threat to our national security is not the young kid who gets on a plane overseas, flies here and tries to light a shoe on fire and blow up an airplane. The greatest threat to our national security is an irresponsible government that lets our fiscal house completely collapse, we implode from, from within, and during our lifetime, we are faced with no longer being the world's superpower. That's what's at stake here. We know that. I would ask that you consider this race. Uh, I think the, the differences are stark. The last speaker spoke of the fact there are 17 seats before Speaker Pelosi becomes the next speaker. I want to turn that around to something personal for, for Pinellas County. I have said since the beginning, this race is about Pinellas County. This race is about having somebody from Pinellas County represent Pinellas County. That's a baseline issue. Personally, I believe that we should have somebody from our own district represent our district. Tampa Bay Times and other news outlets have said, is that really an issue? If Alex Sink is the most qualified candidate in the race, does it really matter if she's from Pinellas County or not? I would dispute the notion that she's more qualified. I don't think she is. But more importantly, I would answer that question with this. We in Pinellas County did not ask Alex Sink to come over here and run. We didn't do it. The DCCC said to Alex Sink, we'll give you $4 million if you move into Pinellas County and run. What does that mean? That means if she is elected on March 11th, 
her allegiance sits in one place, to the DCCC and Debbie Washington Schultz. Debbie Washington Schultz. March 11th, she's either moving back to Pinota Sasser or she's moving to Washington, D.C. She doesn't give a lick about Pinellas County. If I win this race, I'm doing it based on the allegiance of Pinellas County, and that's where my loyalty lies. I can tell you this. I criticize the way the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee is handling her race. I was in a meeting on Tuesday with, her, with the NRCC, and I gave them the same dose of medicine. I need their help. I need the National Party's help. This race in March is going to be a national election. What happens in Pinellas County in March is going to pretend what happens in November. But I will also tell you this, I'm running this race, not the NRCC. The NRCC has no idea what to do with me because I stepped out two weeks ago and said I've got a message that I believe works in Pinellas County. Two weeks ago, somebody took a poll and I was losing to the margin of error. I was about 1.7%. A week ago, I was winning a three-way primary for the Republican nomination. Today, I'm within about 18 points of Alex Sink. We haven't even started, folks. We're going to build a team here in Pinellas County, and in March, we're going to beat Alex Sink. We're going to beat the DCCC. We're going to beat the national political parties. And frankly, I'm going to say it in this room, we are going to beat political bosses here at home who are trying to tell us what to do. Because this is our party, this is our race, and I'm going to ask you to con consider supporting me. So thank you very much. Joe. Concern of um, many people is government transparency. Uh, one thing, <laughs> you have to get notes. Um, <laughs> one thing that uh, one particular congressman does is he actually goes on Facebook and he shares every single vote and an explanation for that vote. I was wondering if you might do the same thing if you were elected. Sure. No, I'd be happy to. I don't know how to use Facebook. <laughs> but I understand I have a Facebook page now. If you uh, no, look, I'm happy to do it. Let me, let me turn this back to another thing. I, I will say we are going to win this race based on a community message. And while I bring to this race very core convictions and what I consider conservative convictions, less government convictions, the fact is whoever is elected to, to this seat is responsible for representing the entire community. So we hold true to our core convictions, but that does not mean that we have to subscribe to the notion that we can't work with people on the other side of the aisle. I work with people on the other side of the aisle. I met with the South Pinellas 912 group last week, and they said, they made a comment to me, you know, one thing we like to do is we like to meet with our elected officials every six months or every three months. My answer was, well, let's do it every month, because that's how we're going to run this race. And I would love to do that with this organization as well. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, just I know where I stand on personal convictions, and, and I believe where you all stand, I think we're going to agree on 80 to 90 percent of the issues. The areas where we don't, let's talk about it, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, but I can tell you that's how we're going to win this race. Transparency, absolutely. Keeping the dialogue open, absolutely. Let's do it. Actually, uh, a couple quick ones here, since I'm getting notes as we go along. Um, uh, audit of the Fed, you support an audit of the Federal Reserve? Absolutely, of course. Uh, War on drugs, you, you favor uh, scaling back the war on drugs? I think the war on drugs has spent a lot of money and done nothing to actually defeat the drug abuse problem we have right now. I mean, that's a perfect example of when we let the government step in and try to offer us solutions. And they tell it, it, it I love this. I, I was having this conversation with somebody yesterday about why is it members of Congress don't ever seem to address the problems that, that we know are the problems. And I can tell you from having worked within the Congress, it's for a very specific reason. Congress defines the problem for us. And then they go parade out the solution that they want us to get excited about. The fact is, most of the time, it's a very false premise at the start. Yes. Right? The idea of a grand bargain, it's not a grand bargain. Sequestration is, does nothing to get us back to where we need to be. But yet, in Washington speak, inside the Beltway, They've defined the problem for us so they can pick winners and losers, and we're supposed to subscribe to the notion that the winners are the people we need to rally behind. The war on drugs is a perfect example of that. Listen, a lot has been done. A lot has been done. Frankly, there are some local champions in, in, uh, in South County right now that are fighting the war. But it's a perfect example of where the government steps forward and says, we're going to define the problem for you. We're going to tell you how much money we're going to spend on it, and you're supposed to think that that's a great thing. Uh, I think it has to be completely reasonable. Do you stand with Rand on the uh, on the drone war, the, the drone bombings that are going on right now? 
We're talking overseas or yeah, yeah. here at home? Yeah, overseas drone bombings. I will tell you, overseas, I think the use of unmanned aerial vehicles is a good thing because it keeps our men and women out of harm's way. Do we need appropriate checks into how they are used? Of course, we absolutely do. The idea of drones here domestically, uh, I think that's obviously a significant problem when it comes to liberty issues. But overseas, the more that we can do overseas to combat our, our wars and protect our men and women, women in uniform, we need to do it. I have a, there, there's another section in that drones though, because there's drones in war zones and then they're using drones to assassinate people in non-war zones. So, you know, if we're at war like in Afghanistan, Iraq, when we're at war, I understand, you know, it's, it's another tool. But if we're going into neutral nations and, and killing people in nations that we're not at war with, we should have an issue with that because we're violating the sovereignty of another nation. You're right. And it is an act of war. I mean, right. There are peace people That's right. Right. That is an act of war. Like it. That's right. That is unless they're, they're also, uh, it's in support of another government, you know, which is a totally different question. Right. I, look, listen, I think the issue of drones is a secondary issue, right? Should we be involved in combat in a particular theater? That mm -hmm. brings up constitutional issues, mm -hmm. war powers issues. Once we know that we are there legally or constitutionally, then the use of drones to protect our men and women in uniform is something we should consider. Mm -hmm. The use of drones to skirt issues, constitutional issues of the War Powers Act, for instance, uh, yeah, it, we don't need to put the issue of drones specifically. Drones are a function. Right. right? It's a tool. But it's a tool. The real issue of constitutional Many of us in here for the past five years or more have been investing all our time in what little spare treasure we have with our families trying to change DC and change our representation. Can you please explain to me why just two weeks ago you decided to get involved or what you've been doing? Sure, sure. So this was a very personal decision for me to get involved. And I will say a couple things. One, because I'm asking for your support, I want to tell you this. I would not have decided to get in this race if I didn't think we could win and beat Alex Sick. I have no interest in getting into a race, getting my teeth kicked in for the next four months if I didn't think we actually could win this race. I also think this is a national election. And we're going into a general election in November that is going to be pivotal. Personally, I think it's going to be a throw the bums out type of election, which is pretty good most of the time. That we have enough of an uprising to say, let's refresh the makeup in Congress. Uh, March, I think, what happens in Pinellas County is going to pretend what happens in the nation, and I think it makes this a critical issue. I like to say I've worked for the people of Pinellas County for 20 years. My first job out of college, when, when I said I left home with nothing more than the support of my family, I hadn't been north of Tennessee. I got in my truck. I had a love for public policy. I drove to Washington, D.C., knowing nobody. I got a job clipping newspapers in the basement of the Republican National Convention, or Committee. This was before the internet. So the way opposition research was done was every day they would fly in newspapers from around the country. A bunch of young folks like myself would read the newspapers, we'd cut out articles, we'd write stuff and send it upstairs to all the smart people. For about $14,000 a year, I convinced a member of Congress that I could walk and chew gum and say yes sir and do all the right things. And so I began a journey of working with Congressman Bill Young. I'll spare you the story, but because I had no money and it cost less to get into the office by 5 a.m. than it did the Metro in, I would sleep in a phone booth between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. just because that saved me two bucks a day. But I started a journey right then working with Congressman Bill Young. And in doing so, so I, I was born here. Uh, this is home for me. As I worked with Mr. Young, I had the opportunity to work with him on issues both within the Congress as well as those that impacted Pinellas County directly. By the late 90s, I kind of started a little bit of a, a part-time work between D.C. and back home here. And then around 2005, finally set up shop here personally and, and bought my permanent residence here and moved down here permanently. Listen, I, I like to say, and I say this humbly, I bring to this opportunity to serve in this office qualifications that I don't believe any other candidate brings. 
We are replacing a member of Congress who is at the top of the seniority in the United States Congress, who could accomplish things with a single phone call. We are replacing that person with somebody who will be number 435 out of 435. Anybody who suggests, whether it's Alex Sink or another candidate that might get in on Tuesday, that they can step into this role and change Washington tomorrow, they're either being disingenuous or, frankly, they, they just don't understand the job that they're getting into. I can tell you this, the effectiveness of the next member of Congress from this district is going to be at the margins. I say this humbly, but I can step into that job because I know that job. I can step in on day one and continue to be effective for the, mem for the people of Pinellas County. I can step in and work with the members of Congress there because I know them. I know the committee structure. I know the process. Uh, we're never going to replace Bill Young. Bill Young is going to cast a long legacy. His, his legacy will cast a, long, cast a long shadow over this election in March. But at the end of the day, this race is going to be won based on who has the qualifications to step in and do the job. And that's why I got into this race, because I believe I can do that. And I say that with humility. Thank you. I'll take one more question. Yes. Uh, now that we all have the hindsight, uh, the advantage of hindsight, would you have invaded Iraq and Afghanistan? That's part of it. The next question is, what have we gained from that? So I'll say this. I think the intelligence made perfect sense for us getting into Afghanistan. Personally, my, my understanding of the issue, having been on Capitol Hill at the time, uh, I believe we know that the root of what happened on 9-11 originated from Al-Qaeda from Osama bin Laden and from Afghanistan. I believe Iraq was something that the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Paul Wolfowitz, at the time, pushed very hard on the administration. <clears throat> at the time, the intelligence that we said was there was that they provided an imminent threat to the United States because of the chemical weapons that they had. I think the intelligence proved out that that might not have been true. This is a tough issue. I'll be very honest with you, and I'm going to tell you, I'm running this race being very honest. You're not going to hear political talking points from me. I've wrestled with this one for a while. When Colin Powell stood before the UN for that final seminal speech where he was to say, this is why we need to go in, what I was begging to hear from him in the first two or three minutes was why. Why we have to do it. It's a hard question. What I finally resolved in my mind having worked at Walter Reed and Bethesda with a lot of the uh, returning wounded, many of them who have become dear friends, who sacrifice, uh, some of them sacrifice their lives, but most of the ones uh, that I've had the opportunity to work with, frankly, fortunately survived but lost limbs. I can say this, I, I do believe that in many ways we are a safer world because we were able to get rid of Saddam Hussein. That doesn't mean that we will always be a safer world because of that. What was left was chaos. There are questions as to whether or not the chaos we created in Iraq created a stronger Iran. That's what we're facing today. You know, you could make the argument, the geopolitical argument, that had we not gone into Iraq, Iraq and Iran would have counterbalanced each other, and we would still have that, uh, that situation today. I didn't, have, I, I didn't have the benefit of the intelligence when we went into Iraq. And it's hard to play hindsight. It really is. If, if I had been in that situation in 2003, presented with evidence that I believed demonstrated that Iraq had a role in 9-11 and, and had a hand in, in the terrorism that we were facing, yes, I probably would have supported going in. It's easy now saying that the information wasn't as strong as we should have had and so maybe we shouldn't have gone in. It's a hard issue. But I truly believe, knowing the sacrifice of men and women that went there, that in many ways we're a safer place because we were there. There aren't any other questions. Uh, listen, I, I'm going to ask you to consider supporting us during this campaign. I can tell you this. We're going to be honest every day about where we stand. I made a promise to myself that I was going to be honest with myself every day we run this race. On March 12th, if I wake up and have been elected, then that's a great thing. If I wake up, I prefer Alex Sink not be the representative, but I can tell you if I'm honest every day between now and March 12th, I'm going to wake up and be just fine however this race turns out. I'm going to ask you to consider supporting me. 
We have ordered a lot of collateral material that should be in in the next week. Right now, the central place for information on my campaign is davidjolly.com. Uh, the email address you can find on that site, or it's david at davidjolly.com. The other thing I will say, and this goes back to this being a Pinellas County race, uh, next Saturday, so a week from today, Krabby Bill's Indian Rock Speech. They are shutting down the restaurant. We are having a community. We're calling it a fundraiser. It's not really a fundraiser. It's just a community outreach opportunity for everybody to come. Uh, 4 to seven thirty, ten dollars $10. It's a Pinellas County fish fry. That includes your food and your drink. Come spend some time with us. Let's talk about all these issues again in person. Uh, let's get to know each other. And please invite anybody you know that might be able to join. Please consider supporting us. I promise you this. We all know we haven't beat Alex Sink. Let's go do it. Let's do it in March. Let's beat Alex Sink. Thank you all. I appreciate it.